Good afternoon. My name is Melinda Herring, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council here in Washington. We're so happy to have you here for our second debate, Is NATO Still Relevant?, which is being co-sponsored by the Transatlantic Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council and hosted in partnership with the Charles Koch Institute. We're very grateful for their support. Our third debate will focus on Europe, and we hope that you'll tune in in September. Now, I'd like to ask you to participate in our debate. We have a, a poll going, and you can participate in the chat function below if you're on Zoom, or look at Twitter and use the, the handle at AC Eurasia. Now, it's my great pleasure to turn it over to one of the sparkiest uh, public intellectuals in Washington, Dr. Corey Shockey. She's going to moderate this debate. Dr. Shockey is the Director of Foreign Policy and Defense Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Before AEI, she was the Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. She's had a very distinguished career. She's worked at the State Department, DOD, and the National Security Council. She's written five books. Her latest is called America Versus the West, Can the Liberal Order Be Preserved? And I received it as a birthday gift. It's quite good. She <laughs> is also the editor with a former Secretary of Defense, James Mattis, of an important new book as well. She's been featured in all the, the main publications. Have a look at her Twitter feed. It's a lot of fun. So Dr. Shockey, over to you and good luck to our debaters. Thank you. So much, Melinda. It is my privilege to moderate this debate today between four important public intellectuals. Let me start with the format before introducing them to you. We are going to give each of them four minutes apiece to make an opening argument, then we will have a moderated debate with seven minutes of questions and answers between me and each team with a four minute rebuttal uh, by the opposing team back and forth on that. Uh, then we will have a conclusion and then we will take questions and answers from the audience. So please gun up and get ready for the challenges you want to bring to these four extraordinary experts on NATO and the international order. Let me start by introducing Dr. Sarah Björg Moller. She's an assistant professor of international security at the School of Diplomacy and International Relations. Professor Moller's current research examines the military effectiveness of alliances and coalitions in multinational conflicts. Prior to joining the school in 2015, Dr. Muller was a pre-doctoral research fellow at the Institute for Security and Conflict Studies at the George Washington Elliott School of International Affairs. Dr. John Mearsheimer is the R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago, where he has taught since 1982. He graduated from West Point in 1970, served five years as an officer in the U.S. Air Force. Professor Mearsheimer has written extensively about security issues in international politics and published six books. On the opposing team, Ambassador Sandy Vershbo is a distinguished fellow at the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. Ambassador Vershbo was the Deputy Secretary General of NATO from February 2012 to October 2016. Prior to that post, he served for three years as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs and Ambassador John Herbs, Director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Ambassador Herbs served 31 years as a Foreign Service Officer in the State Department. Uh, he was the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine from 2003 to 2006, where he worked to enhance U.S.-Ukrainian relations. Prior to that, he was Ambassador to Uzbekistan, and most recently served as the Director of of the Center for Complex Operations at National Defense University. Okay, my friends, you know how we are going on this. Let us start with uh, Professor Mearsheimer. You have uh, four minutes, my friend. Fire your best shot. Thank you, Corey. Uh, the subject that we're here to debate is NATO's relevance. And that prompts two questions, relevant for whom, and here my argument is that I'm gonna talk about NATO's relevance for the United States. And then second, what does relevance mean? And I think in the case of the United States, it boils down to whether or not the United States should remain militarily committed to NATO, whether we should keep military forces, large scale military forces in Europe. And my answer to that is no. 
And there are many reasons for that, but the principal reason is geopolitical. Uh, and it has to do with containing China. There are three areas of the world that matter to the United States strategically. Three areas you want to fight and die for. Uh, one is Europe, two is East Asia, and three is the Persian Gulf. Those are the three key areas of the world. And for the United States, the key question is whether or not there is a potential hegemon in one of those regions. Uh, one of the reasons that we stayed in Europe during the Cold War was because the Soviet threat was concentrated in Europe, and we didn't want the Soviets to become a regional hegemon. The fact is, there is no regional hegemon in Europe today or on the horizon. And indeed, there is a regional hegemon in the system, or a potential regional hegemon in the system. It's China, and it is in East Asia. That means that the United States should concentrate all its military might in East Asia to deal with China. Uh, that is what really matters. Europe does not matter very much at all because there is no potential hegemon there today. Now, one might say we could still keep troops in Europe because we had troops in Europe and the Far East during the Cold War. The problem with that argument is that China is a much more formidable adversary than the Soviet Union was during the Cold War. It has many more people relative to us, and it is far more wealthier than the Soviet Union was. So uh, we have to concentrate on East Asia. Furthermore, the United States has significant problems at home, and the United States needs to do nation building at home, as Barack Obama put it in 2008. And we therefore have to cut back our commitments around the world as much as possible at the same time that we contain China. Now, one might argue that the United States needs to stay in Europe for the purposes of containing Russia. There is a real Russian threat out there in addition to a Chinese threat. I have two points to make on that. First of all, we, the United States and its allies, and specifically NATO, created the Russian threat. It was NATO expansion coupled with EU expansion and the color revolutions in Eastern Europe that caused this crisis with the Russians. So NATO's relevance in this particular case is it pushed Russia into the arms of the Chinese. In a world where your principal goal is to contain the Chinese, the last thing you want to deal do is drive the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. And who is principally responsible for that? NATO, NATO expansion. Furthermore, if you do believe the Russians are a great threat, uh, and I don't buy that argument, this is a country that has the GNP of roughly Italy, uh, the Europeans themselves can deal with Russia. Uh, the Europeans have much more wealth than the Russians. The Europeans have more people, and they already spend roughly four times more on defense than the Russians do. So I say it's time to get out of Europe and to focus on the real threat to American interests, which is China. Thank you very much, Professor Mearsheimer. Next up, Professor Muller, your opening statement, please. Thank you, Corey, and my thanks to the Atlantic Council and the Charles Koch Institute. Is NATO still relevant? Relevant to whom, I would ask. And so I want to make clear that I'm arguing about NATO's collective relevancy for all of its members. And I would argue that NATO is in danger of becoming irrelevant because it lacks a strategic focus. Already, you can probably tell that my argument and my position shares much in common with the French president's brain death sentiments from last winter. A club whose members can't agree on the purpose of the club, who each want and expect different things from the club, is a club that is in trouble. So NATO is in danger of losing its collective relevancy for all of its members, I would argue, because it suffers from a strategic deficit. The central question, as I see it, is what is NATO's purpose today? During the Cold War, it had a very clear and defined purpose. It was to deter and defend against the Soviet Union. Since the 1990s, NATO has been engaged in never-ending transformations, starting with the 1991 strategic concept, where we saw the adoption of two new security mandates for NATO. We get projecting stability and crisis management, cooperative security, 
along with an open door to enlargement. And I would argue that the net result has been mission creep for NATO. So NATO gets into the peacekeeping business. NATO gets into, admittedly at the request of the Americans, the counterterrorism nation building business. NATO gets into the security sector reform business. NATO gets into the counter piracy and fighting illegal migration business. There are even those who now argue that NATO is ideally situated for tackling organized crime and corruption. So the result is that members want and expect different things from NATO. They no longer see eye to eye. And here I think the clearest example of this is with respect to Russia. We have the classic split in the alliance between the eastern and southern flank, but we also have a NATO member, Turkey, who is purchasing weapon systems from Russia and attempting to block the uh, defense plan for the Baltics. On the other hand, we have countries like France, which is uh, 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 exploring rapprochement with the Russians. So there's a lack of consensus about the strategic purpose. And this lack of consensus about NATO's strategic purpose jeopardizes its future relevancy, I would argue. The last point I want to make here is that this strategic crisis, this strategic deficit that NATO faces today predates President Trump and his administration. So I think it's a mistake to assume that come January 2021, if there's a change in occupancy in the White House, that NATO can just go back to normal, a return to normal, back to business as usual. I don't see that happening because for me, the $64,000 question NATO needs to deal with, that the members need to address, is what is NATO's purpose today? Thank you. Thank you. We have heard two very strong arguments that NATO no longer remains relevant for the United States. And before I go to our diplomatic contingent to make the arguments in favor of NATO's relevance, I see that I neglected an important piece of my responsibilities, which is telling all of you how to submit your questions for the debate. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom interface to cast your vote, follow the link. Thank you very much. And now over to you, Ambassador Virchbaum. Thanks very much, Corey. Uh, most of my career was spent at NATO or working on NATO policy, so it probably won't surprise anyone that I think the Alliance is still very relevant today. Uh, first of all, I would argue NATO remains essential to deter Russian aggression, which is a real th threat, and it's necessary to prevent great power conflict in Europe. It's also a standing coalition of like-minded democracies that the United States can still call upon uh, to defend shared interests and project stability beyond NATO's borders. Having allies and in institutions like NATO gives us an, ex an extraordinary advantage uh, over Russia, China, and other adversaries, even if Donald Trump doesn't get it. Now, yes, I, I agree NATO faces many internal challenges, uh, not least an erosion of US leadership, plus frictions with Turkey, Hungary, and other illiberal member states. Uh, there are differences in threat perceptions that can lead to divergent views on alliance uh, priorities. But in my experience, uh, while keeping the allies together is a 24-7 job, uh, but allies usually find a way to resolve their differences because alliance unity is too important to put at risk. Now, I'm happy to debate these current issues further, but uh, I would hope that the focus of our debate can be on the future. Uh, what does NATO need to do to remain relevant in the face of new threats and challenges uh, that have already been mentioned? If NATO's secret of success these past 71 years has been its adaptability, where does NATO need to adapt next uh, over the coming decade so that it can continue to protect common interests and maintain public support on both sides of the Atlantic? Now, there's a long to-do list on the military side, but I think it's NATO's political role where new thinking is most needed. Uh, this is the focus of this reflection process now taking place on NATO 2030. Uh, here are the top four priorities as I see them. First, uh, NATO needs a new transatlantic bargain on burden sharing. Uh, we need to stay in Europe, but we need to do better and move beyond today's narrow focus on defense spending, aiming for a more balanced partnership for the long term. Specifically by 2030, I think the European allies should contribute 50% of the crit critical capabilities now provided mainly by the US. 
this would equip them to handle most crises without U.S. support and allow us to shift more of our assets to Europe, uh, from Europe to the Asia Pacific, uh, which bring me, brings me to my second point, which is China. Uh, allies are beginning to understand the scope of the challenge from Beijing and the value of a transatlantic approach. Uh, I think NATO is the right forum to share intelligence and to set policy on immediate security threats uh, like protecting 5G networks, transportation infrastructure, medical supply chains, uh, and also to figure out how to engage China on arms control. Uh, the agenda doesn't have to be comprehensive at the start. It could evolve over time, working with the European Union uh, to address China's activism in the Arctic and the Belt and Road Initiative. NATO could even invite Asian democracies to join a Euro-Pacific Partnership Council uh, to increase the allies' leverage for influ influencing Chinese behavior. A third, I think NATO needs a more effective southern strategy uh, to mitigate instability in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, NATO's training and capacity building programs are woefully underfunded and have little strategic effect, uh, nor has NATO done much to deter Russia's aggressive posture in the area since 2015. Uh, I think that until NATO does more in the MED, uh, the Southern Allies could be less willing to support defense of the Eastern flank, or could even go it alone as Turkey has been doing lately in Syria and Libya. Fourth, uh, NATO needs a more dynamic approach to Russia. Uh, the Alliance has done well in rebuilding deterrence since 2014, but it's been less effective in countering Moscow's political warfare against and our societies Russia, and our values. Your time is up. I'm sorry I need to intrude on you. I promise okay. when we get to the questions, I will give you the opportunity to finish that thought. Next up on the defense of the Alliance, Ambassador Herbst. Okay, thank you very much. I think first we need to understand just how important NATO is. And let's remember that there were two world wars in Europe and the United States commitment to NATO and to Europe led to 75 years without great power war and unprecedented prosperity. Foreign policy is more effective, more realistic, less risky when you have allies and NATO is the premier alliance. Now, professors Mearsheim and Muller talked about how NATO allies now don't have quite the same understanding of things. And I would say they kind of exaggerate the present at the expense of the past. Um, NATO was never single-minded. You had a major crisis, the Suez crisis in 1956, where the US opposed the activities of France and England. Nothing comparable has happened in the post-Cold War world as stark as that. You also had major ally differences with the deployments of the Persians in Europe in the 1980s. Despite that, NATO was essential to defeat the Soviet Union, and NATO is essential today. Professor Mearsheimer is right that China is the big problem, but Russia remains a major threat. In fact, I'd say Russia remains the most important near-term threat because Putin's activities are truly destabilizing. The fact that he's launched a war in Europe, the first time a major power has been fighting a war in Europe since the end of World War II, is a major danger we need to stop them, and NATO is the way to do it. But NATO is essential as well, as Sandy mentioned, to address the problem of China. We want our NATO allies with us to help deal with the Chinese threat, and it has to be in conjunction also with the EU. We've seen the utility in this, this lately, as the Brits have now joined us and is blocking Huawei. We want to bring the EU along, and we want NATO to be a factor with this. To make the point about alliances further. It's not just NATO that's our ally, it's Japan and South Korea and Australia. We need to work with them and with NATO containing the Chinese threat. And again, we do not want to walk away from NATO. NATO has a role. Okay. Wow. Uh, Professor Mearsheimer is, has wisely argued against our overextension in the Middle East over the past 20 years one of the few voices that doing that. But even with that mistaken policy, we had fewer expenses and less risk because we had our NATO allies and others with us. Again, China and Russia have no allies. We do. We do not want to toss away this key advantage. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So now we have about uh, seven minutes for me to question Professors Mearsheimer and Muller. And I want to start by picking up a point that I see I was muted. Now I think you can hear me. Uh, so let me start in the seven minutes that we have for me to question Professors Muller and Mearsheimer. To start with you, Professor Mearsheimer, because you made a very good case that, um, that Europeans have the capacity to manage Europe. And I want to ask whether you think the United States and its Asian allies have the capacity to manage a rising China without European assistance, or what kind of assistance you expect to get if we leave Europeans to manage Europe and a disputatious Russia? We're not going to get any military assistance from our European allies, our NATO allies, in containing China. It's going to be done by our Asian allies and the United States. Uh, the Europeans don't spend enough money on defense, and they have remarkably little power projection capability. They're free riders in Europe. The idea that they're going to help us in East Asia is not a serious argument. Furthermore, we're going to have our hands full, we, the United States, trying to contain China and trying to coordinate the efforts of all of these allies in Asia who are spread out all over the map. It's going to be a Herculean task. We're not going to have time to be in Europe trying to manage relations there. My, <coughs> excuse me, Corey. My argument is that what we ought to do is focus laser-like on East Asia because China is the threat and get out of Europe and let the Europeans take care of their own defense. So Professor Muller, uh, Professor Mearsheimer makes a narrow argument that military power is what we need Europeans to contribute in Asia. And because they can't contribute that, they add no value. Do you share that judgment that the military aspects of this problem are the entirety of the assistance we should or could want from Europeans? So I come at it from a slightly different role, and I think it harkens back to the NATO identity crisis that I spoke about a moment ago. And that is that NATO, although the treaty makes clear, is a military and political alliance, the reality is for much of its history, it emphasized its military role. And I think what's happened since the end of the Cold War is NATO has tried to do uh, and be all things to all members, to be both a political organization as well as a traditional collective defense organization. And so part of this mission creep has resulted in trying to be also a cooperative security argument. With regards to China, um, I was uh, pleased to see that the recent uh, communique, the declaration out of London this past week, uh, we, uh, winter, excuse me, acknowledged China. I think it was long overdue because as Secretary uh, General Stoltenberg mentioned, China is already in the Arctic. It's already in the Horn of Africa. We've got the Belt and Road Initiative competing for influence. We also have the 17 plus one initiative uh, which features Central and Eastern Europe and China. So I think there's already a, a theme uh, emerging from all of our comments today that NATO needs to be doing more on China. I would argue the way to do that would be to streamline and consolidate some of NATO's fun functions to offload some of those functions onto other institutions like the EU, thereby freeing up uh, NATO and allowing it to specialize, that's how institutions succeed. Uh, I, I worry that institutions where we keep adding on new activities, new missions, um, are not sustainable. Thank you. Uh, John, let me, let me pivot back to you, or rebalance, uh, <laughs> to use the delicacy of the Obama administration's phrasing. Um, uh, perhaps I was unfair in suggesting that you were narrowly focusing on the military contributions Europeans could or would make in Asia. Can I ask you to say a little bit more about whether you think there is anything Europeans can and should be contributing to man help manage the rise of China? Yes, I wouldn't say you were unfair to me, but I think you somewhat 
narrowed my argument to the point where it didn't completely reflect what I think. There's no question in my mind that we need the Europeans to help us with China on the economic front. It's very important that they not trade dual use technologies with the Chinese. They not, in a sense, feed the beast economically. And I think we should therefore work very carefully with the Europeans at a political level and an economic level. But in my mind, this has nothing to do with NATO because NATO is a military alliance. Military power is at the essence of NATO. And the question is, can this alliance use its military force in Asia or some other place around the globe to help contain the Chinese? And I see zero evidence that that's possible at this point in time. And again, as I said to you, Corey, I think it's essential that we concentrate on containing China because the Chinese threat is so significant, especially if it continues to grow economically. So that's the principal reason that I would like to, uh, you know, pull forces out of Europe and focus laser like on the China threat. Professor Muller, let me ask you one other question. You uh, rattled off a list of things that NATO has been involved in, uh, dealing with migration, uh, non-proliferation, uh, insecurity in Africa. If NATO focuses, as you recommend, on managing China, uh, those other problems don't go away. How do we, as a community of like-minded nations who care about those issues, where, who handles those if NATO is not the tool to handle them? Well, it goes back to my central point, which is that NATO can't be all things to all members, and it has to figure out what kind of alliance it wants to be. Does it want to be a collective security organization, a political organization, or, as it was initially intended, and as John pointed out, a traditional military alliance, a collective defense arrangement? I would argue the EU could be doing more, and there are other institutions as well. NATO is not a humanitarian agency, and it shouldn't be going into an, uh, the business of infection disease either. It's not an infectious disease agency. We have the who that for that. So I would argue there are existing institutions that can tackle some of these other problems, which we've seen in recent decades, um, NATO tackle. Okay, Ambassador Herbs, for the opposing team, you get a four minute rebuttal. Okay, I'd like to start with Sara's last point. Um, NATO, of course, is principally a military alliance, but it was always more than that. It was a democratic club which reflected values which were important in and of themselves and also for our international position. Two, I'd like to take issue with Professor Mearsheimer talking about Europe can handle Russia without the United States. There's a, there's a hint of economic determinism in his argument. Since the European economy is so much larger than the Russian economy, Europe should be able to manage it. But even at the height of the Cold War, the European economy dwarfed the Soviet economy. Without the United States, you had no stability in Europe. And that's true today. The United States' presence in the transatlantic relationship has stabilized Europe. We should not be playing games with abstract theories and move the United States out of Europe. Third point. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Mearsheimer's written that eventually Russia and the United States will be allies against China. I agree with that. But the question is, how do we get there? The United States and the West are not responsible for the new Cold War in Europe. The Kremlin is because it insists on dominating its neighbors. It insists on dominating its neighbors. That is not in our interest. And if Russia is a great power rival, which it is, why should we cede Ukraine to Russia? Ukraine is able to withstand Russia with our help to do it successful. And that is very much in our interest. Uh, Okay, I think that's it for now. Okay, so now I get the pleasure of challenging Ambassador Vershba and Ambassador Herbst. And let me start with you, Sandy. You made a case for... Oh. Doggone it. <laughs> okay, so tech guys, stop muting me. Um, so now I get the pleasure of challenging Ambassador Herbst and Ambassador Vershbaum. Let me start with you, Sandy. 
you made an incredibly expansive case for a new set of NATO missions. And I saw Sarah and John reeling back like, like people in a 1950s science fiction movie. And you didn't quite have time to finish your agenda on Russia. So let me start by asking you to, um, to answer what you think NATO should be doing with Russia and why you think it'll work now since your debate partner just mentioned it hasn't worked up to now. Thanks. Uh, well, I think the problem is that we've been largely in a kind of static and reactive mode uh, to Russia since uh, they invaded Ukraine six years ago. And we need to take the initiative. Uh, I think as in the 60s, when NATO served as the forum for shaping the policies of detente using, you know, through the Harmel report, it showed that NATO can be effective as a political organization as well as a military organization. Uh, but I think we have that similar opportunity here to shape a new strategy for, for Russia, which today is characterized by strategic competition. But I think if we can come up with a more effective uh, mix of carrots and sticks, we may be able to steer Russia back towards a more cooperative stance, not necessarily going back to uh, what we thought were the, uh, the good old days of the 1990s, uh, but at least getting Russia to, to uh, pay a higher price for its aggressive actions and over time move back towards a more constructive policy consisting, consistent with the obligations that it took, I mean, even help write those obligations in the Helsinki Final Act and in the NATO-Russia Founding Act. Uh, it is, it's not a quick fix strategy, but I think at the moment Russia has uh, the initiative and uh, we have to uh, put them more on the back foot uh, to shape their behavior in, in the right way. Part of that is continuing to stand up for the security and sovereignty of Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, NATO enlargement is not going to happen anytime soon, and I'm not arguing that that uh, is something we should be revisiting now. But I think, as John just said, it's in our interest to, that Russia's neighbors be independent, that their sovereignty be re respected, Otherwise, Russia will sooner or later feel that it has opportunities to take a bite out of uh, the Baltic states and uh, will be back into a, the old Cold War, not just the new Cold War with China. Ambassador Herbst, you made um, a ringing endorsement of NATO as an alliance of common democratic values. Um, and this would come as a surprise uh, to the generals who ruled Turkey or uh, those who conducted the coup in Greece. Um, and uh, I confess that it might even surprise uh, President Erdogan or even Prime Minister Orban. Um, persuade me that I'm wrong and that that these, the democratic backsliding that we've done nothing about doesn't matter as we make promises that we will put young American women and men on the line to defend countries that do not apparently share our values. The world's a highly imperfect place. And there's no question that the general thrust within NATO as a club of democratic nations is not uniform across the board. And of course, a non-democratic Turkey was with the alliance for decades. But by and large, it was a, as a club of democratic nations, and the emphasis has always been towards democracy. One thing not mentioned in this debate is the fact that the expansion of NATO was also the expansion of democracy. Not a clear and perfect expansion, as the Orban example underscores, but by and large, a very, a very important uh, promotion of democracy. Also, a promotion which removed flashpoints in Europe an insistence that ethnic tensions between nations be resolved, like between Hungary and Romania, which led to, which is part of the lead up to World War II. These things all were placed in a, in a certain container. Uh, it's hard to underscore the value of the democratic element within, within the alliance and the implications, positive implications for stability. Mm -hmm. um. Ambassador Vershbaugh, how do you propose to persuade NATO allies to undertake the expansion of missions and the set of priorities that you recommend? 
you're a hard-bitten veteran of all of those NATO debates. Uh, give us a sense of what, what does move allies. How do we persuade them to undertake what you are arguing for? Because it seems like a very long shot. Well, first of all, I think uh, allies want NATO to be useful to them in addressing what they see as their short-term priorities. So there's also a, there's always a, an element of uh, give and take and balancing. I mean, Sarah spoke about this east-south divide, but actually, allies in the south recognize that they have to contribute to the defense of the eastern flank in order to get the rest of the alliance to pay attention to what they worry the most about. So I think it's it's part of a negotiating process. But I think the allies do genuinely want NATO to be effective. And I think uh, they recognize that the US is shifting its sights to, to Asia, to China, and that they are gonna have to do more uh, for their own defense. So that's why I suggest a new transatlantic bargain in that regard. Uh, at the same time, I think getting them to take primary responsibility for the Middle East, North Africa, is also something that we can persuade them to do uh, because uh, they, they still want to preserve the overall security guarantee that comes with the alliance. But I think that on, on China, uh, they recognize uh, that China is coming toward Europe, even if they're not going to be going militarily. They, they the allies, are not going to be going militarily to, to the Pacific. Uh, but there are a lot of aspects of China's policy uh, in the Arctic, the Belt and Road Initiative, their expanding military presence in the Horn of Africa, that uh, call out for continued collaboration with the United States, and NATO is the place to forge that policy the way that we did forge the policy on Russia uh, during the Cold War. Professor Muller, you have four minutes to rebut these arguments. Thank you, Corey. Uh, there's a lot on the table. Uh, regarding values, I think you addressed that point um, quite adroitly, pointing out that uh, NATO had, uh, for many years in its history, non-democratic members. Uh, also, I would add that spreading democracy hasn't worked out very well for NATO. We can look at not just Hungary and Turkey, that has already been mentioned, but I would add Poland to this. Um, and it goes back to the point that NATO has to focus. The last comment that Ambassador Verschbau just made about allies wanting a NATO to be useful to them for what they see as the main challenge goes directly back to my point that they all see different things. I actually think NATO is more divided uh, than is often uh, acknowledged. I understand why the Alliance wants to gloss over some of those divisions and talk about unity, but the reality is uh, from issue to issue, whether it's Russia, right? The Europeans themselves don't agree on the nature of the Russian threat. Yes, the way forward in the past has been to negotiate. And so for every enhanced forward presence we get, we get something like the Southern hub at JFC Naples, right? But how long does this go on? How long do we stretch NATO? Uh, adaptation, and NATO has successfully ad adapted in the past, I'm fond of saying adaptation is not a strategy. Strategy requires that you prioritize among challenges and threats and that you recognize that not every challenge and issue out there in the world today rises to the level that NATO needs to be tackling it. Uh, this is part of what I see as the NATOization of every issue in the last three decades. Furthermore, uh, regarding uh, Ukraine and uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe, look, um, no one I think would argue that Putin's Russia is an angel. Uh, but unfortunately, international politics is not a game of candy land. Um, and furthermore, I think we need to acknowledge that NATO's expansion has been a contributing factor in Russian behavior. I often ask my students uh, the counterfactual of assume that the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact had won the Cold War. How would you as Americans feel about Canada and Mexico joining the Warsaw Pact? Um, furthermore, it's not clear to me that uh, contributing more military forces to Europe uh, and to the eastern flank in particular is going to address the other concerns we have with Russia, the malign interference and in behaviors, the disinformation campaigns, the uh, interventions in our campaign, in, 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 uh, in our electoral campaigns. 
So my bottom line is that yes, Russian behavior is troubling, but international politics is uh, uh, is complicated, and I think NATO needs to focus on figuring out what it wants to prioritize, what it wants to be, and the way forward for this is, uh, as I see it, streamlining NATO, consolidating it around certain core missions, and I would argue China is at the top of the list. And finally, the way you can do this is to spin off responsibilities to the EU. Um, here I would suggest we look at the EU's three C's initiative, uh, which is a forum of 12 EU members um, and addresses joint concerns. So there's a way to reform NATO, reorganize it that doesn't involve the standard adaptation behavior of the past where we add more items to NATO's agenda and it gets diluted. Thank you. Uh, so this has been a wonderful and rich debate. Uh, and I think now we go to questions and answers. Uh, isn't that right? Please, Melinda, correct me if I'm wrong by going to question and answers. Ah, uh, now we have the concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Georgie, for correcting me. Four minutes each. Ambassador Vershbo, I believe you start. Okay, um, I unmuted. Yeah. Oh, first, just very briefly, uh, I don't uh, buy the arguments that uh, NATO enlargement is what contributed to the breakdown in re relations with Russia. Uh, and yes, uh, the Bush administration didn't handle the famous 2008 Bucharest summit very well. But let's remember that in 2010, uh, Yanukovych basically withdrew U Ukraine's application for NATO membership. And I would say it was Putin who should have quit while he was ahead when he had uh, Ukraine pursuing a non-block policy and uh, extending the Black Sea Fleet le lease until 2042. Uh, but I think that the overall NATO enlargement has been a plus for European stability and security, even if we have some outliers like Mr. Orban uh, that are still a challenge. Uh, but I think more generally, uh, I still would argue that uh, NATO is able to uh, do multiple tasks uh, it's, a, it's both a military and a political alliance, and it, uh, I think that's been its source of strength and effectiveness over the years. And I would say that in a complex, multipolar world uh, like we have now, we need allies more than ever. Uh, and having alliances like NATO with uh, like-minded members and other partners who share uh, the same values and are ready to share risks and even pay the ultimate price, as many of them have done in Afghanistan and other, other theaters, is ultimately uh, an advantage for the United States. It's a force multiplier. It's a source of legitimacy when we need to use force, and we shouldn't put that at risk. Now, a lot of things that come out in debates are either or choices. Uh, clearly, NATO isn't going to be shut down unless Donald Trump has some October surprise in store for us. And uh, I think the notion of withdrawing from Europe would be counterproductive to U.S. interests, and the Europeans, uh, while they need to shoulder more of the burden, uh, don't need to shoulder all of the burden. We need them outside of Europe, and I think that's that. That should be uh, kind of how we proceed. Uh, but I think that uh, you know, clearly NATO isn't the solution to every problem. I agree with Sarah in that sense that uh, uh, it's an instrument, and we should only give it tasks that it's equipped to achieve, and not overload it with make work projects. Uh, it may only play a supporting role in many cases, as it's doing now with the pandemic, with logistical assistance. Uh, we should indeed ask the EU to be doing more and create a much more healthy division of labor for the long term so that the U.S. can focus on the strategic priorities in Asia and elsewhere. Uh, but, uh, but I think NATO still has, has a, a bright future. It'll be even brighter if uh, we can get past this era of abdication of U.S. leadership uh, and have a more traditional uh, leadership role for the United States uh, in NATO. And hopefully we'll get back to the spirit of solidarity and unity of purpose that have helped NATO get through difficult patches in the past. Excellent. And the final concluding remarks from the opposing team, Professor Mearsheimer, you have four minutes, my friend. Thank you again. Corey, I want to make two sets of points. First of all, I fully understand that NATO was an incredibly formidable and impressive institution during the Cold War. It was probably the greatest military alliance in contemporary history. I have no doubt about that. 
Uh, I remember when the Mansfield Amendment was a hot subject and we were talking about pulling American troops out of Europe, it made me literally sick to my stomach. So I'm not somebody who disliked NATO during the Cold War. But the fact is, folks, we live in a completely different world. In fact, the world has undergone two fundamental shifts in the distribution of power since the Cold War. One was the movement from bipolarity, which characterized the Cold War, to unipolarity. And now we're moving from unipolarity to multipolarity. And as these shifts have taken place, Europe's importance to the United States, leave NATO aside, Europe's importance has gone down. For most of my life, Europe was the most important area of the world strategically. It dominated Asia, it dominated the Gulf. That's no longer the case. It's simply because the distribution of power has changed. Asia is the area that really matters the most to the United States today. And the question is, what can Europe do? What can NATO do militarily? And my argument is it can do hardly anything. And we have to wake up and smell the coffee. Second point, which has not gotten much attention here, which is very, very important, is that the United States is in big trouble on the home front even before the pandemic hit, and this is a disaster, the United States was in trouble. The fact that Bernie Sanders probably would have beaten Hillary Clinton in a fair fight tells you that something is going on here. Bernie Sanders is a self-declared socialist. The idea that a self-declared socialist is a viable candidate for the presidency of the United States is quite remarkable. And even worse, consider the possibility that the possibility, the reality, Donald Trump is in the White House. How did this ever happen? How in 2016 did you have Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump as viable candidates? Something's going on here. There are real problems. And now with the pandemic and the consequences of the pandemic, things are worse than ever. We have to do nation building at home. The elites in this country who are concerned with foreign policy have to stop focusing so much on doing nation building and fighting wars abroad and focus more on what's happening in the United States. Because the truth is what happens in the United States matters much more than what happens any place else, including in East Asia with China. So I would just say in this changing world where Europe's importance has gone from number one on the list of strategic priorities to number three, if you're gonna cut somewhere to do nation building at home, the place I'd look to cut is Europe. And the thing that I would cut in Europe is NATO because we spend too much money on military commitments in Europe, which we can't afford, number one, given the China threat, and number two, given the need to do nation building at home. Thank you. Thank you, my friends. So we have 12 minutes and an outstanding group of people participating in the questions. So here's what I'm gonna do. Because we have 18 questions and only 12 minutes, I am gonna read the questions, I'm gonna direct it to one individual, and I'm gonna ask you to discipline yourselves to give a one or maximally two sentence answer, and I'm gonna cut you off if you go beyond that, because I want everybody to get the opportunity to participate. First question from Stanley Sloan. I'm gonna throw it your direction, John Mearsheimer, uh, which is, I'll be looking forward to hearing from the NATO skeptics what alternative international arrangements they would recommend in place of NATO. One sentence or two, John. NATO without the United States. Okay, excellent discipline. Next question from Donny R. M. And it is also to you, John Mearsheimer. You've previously said that Russia is a declining great power. And my question is, will the further stagnation of Russia's economy, continuing exponential rise of China, increase the chances of Russia being admitted into NATO? Is that even a possibility? No, I think it's impossible because relations between the West and Russia have been so thoroughly poisoned that it's impossible to think of Russia becoming part of NATO. Uh, next question to John Herbst uh, from Hank Cohen, a retired Foreign Service officer. If NATO loses US troops, is it fair to say that Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia are likely to become Finlandized? Uh, the short answer is yes. Our troops are essential for security in Europe and for stopping Kremlin 
Oh, I so love how crisp, succinct, and pungent all of you are in your answers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, next up, from Pascal Siegel, NATO outspends Russia by 15 to 1. What additional deterrence does additional spending buy? I'm going to give this one to you, Sandy Vershbaugh. Isn't it time to talk about smart spending as opposed to more spending? Well, first of all, Russian defense spending figures are not entirely reliable, uh, so I think the gap is not quite as great. Uh, but yeah, we do have to set clear priorities, but I think we've seen through the Russians, Russians' ability to rapidly mobilize huge forces with little warning that uh, what we've done since 2016 is uh, basically the minimum that we need to do, and we we, we can think of a rosier future when we can there. Uh, moving on, the next question from Valeria Yagsman, the question to the no team. If Russia attacks Eastern Europe, for example, the Baltic states, will Europe not be able to protect these countries? Do you see the U.S. intervening then? To you, Professor Mahler. Thank you. Um, two questions, two sentences will be hard. I think the real problem is political. Uh, when you talk to NATO officers in the Baltics and Poland, they're worried about the decision lag uh, in Brussels. So that's a political question. And uh, I think Europe is capable of uh, uh, defending from Russia. I'm going to stay with you, Professor Muller, for the next question from Jack Emerson. Is something similar to CETO or Asia Pacific NATO? feasible for containing China? Europeans were willing to put aside differences in history to contain the USSR. Could Asian Pacific states surrounding China do the same? So here I will remain to my two sentence limit and simply say those are exactly the types of questions that NATO needs to be discussing. Uh, what kind of alliance does it want to be? Next question to you, Ambassador Herbs uh, from Paula Margolis. Does NATO act as a deterrent to conflicts? Without a unifying structure, would countries feel less contained and break out more often? There's no doubt that NATO has been the key force for stability in Europe before, it should be during and after the Cold War. Thank you. Next question from Philip Walker. Leave aside what we get from our current engagement in NATO. What does current US engagement in NATO actually cost and if we disengage, what costs might we occur, incur that are currently covered by our level of engagement? Ambassador Vershbaugh? Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I think that uh, roughly about a third of our defense budget probably uh, goes to defense of Europe and of NATO. Uh, but I think if we disengage and have to come back in from, from afar, either from the continental US to, to uh, deal with a crisis, will end up paying more than having a network of bases and uh, burden sharing with allies that we have today. So I would be hesitant to uh, recommend any uh, pullout from, uh, from Europe. Thank you so much, both for the substance and the succinctness. Next up from John Gay, how much do the Baltic states even offer for US security uh, such that our troops should defend them with their lives? There are small states with small economies and small populations sitting on highly vulnerable terrain. Aren't they a major liability? I'm going to actually let both Johns, Mearsheimer and Herbst, have a swing at this because I think it's central to the question of NATO's relevance. First up, John Herbst. Uh, how important was Belgium to, to Britain in World War before World War II and during World War II? Uh, we, the Russian ambition is to dominate further into Europe if they can. Stopping them in the Baltic, stopping them in Donbass in Ukraine is smarter than stopping them in the Baltic. Stopping the Baltics is smarter than having to deal with them in Poland or in Germany. John Mearsheimer. I think the security of Ukraine, the security of the Baltic states matters hardly at all for the United States. Uh, those countries were dominated by the Soviet Union during the Cold War, and it didn't matter for us then, and it doesn't matter for us now, and it won't matter in the future. And I think if the United States had not expanded NATO and provoked the Russians, we wouldn't have the problem that we're facing in Ukraine today, and there wouldn't be a threat of the Russians interfering in the Baltic states. Next up, from, from Ambassador Dan Freed for Professor Muller. 
Does Professor Mueller believe the complications of international politics mean that the U.S. should let Putin control Ukraine? No, uh, but you can manage the Russian relationship in other ways. It's not clear to me how arming Ukraine is going to improve matters. Again, I don't think anyone would argue that Putin is an angel, but we need to avoid taking steps that will increase tensions with Russia. Next up from Paul Hughes, I'm surprised there's been no mention of nuclear strategy and its impact on the relevance of the US to NATO. Yes, both the UK and France have weapons, but in far smaller numbers. John Mearsheimer, I feel like this is your wheelhouse, my friend. I think that if uh, the United States were to pull out of Europe, there's a very good chance that the Germans would eventually go nuclear, uh, simply because they would view themselves as vulnerable without the American nuclear umbrella over their heads. Next up, from Andreas Benke, also to you, Professor Mearsheimer, NATO is all, has always been a mechanism to prevent the renationalization of security in Europe. Should the USA be willing to re-enter the European continent in the future to once again put out any inter-European conflict? My argument is that the only time the United States should become militarily involved in Europe is when there's a potential hegemon, a state that threatens to dominate all of Europe that cannot be contained by the local powers. There is no such state present now. There is no such state on the horizon. And therefore, it's time to either go home or go to East Asia and help contain China. This next one, I want to give to you, Ambassador Verschbau. It's from Matthew Saville from Britain. Dr. Mueller has pointed out that NATO is a political alliance, but one which is predominantly focused on military capabilities. Does NATO have the ability to coordinate civilian organizations to deal with security concerns like migration, disinformation, and climate change? Should it even be attempting to do so? I think it has the capacity to do that, but it's not, but it, it's not necessarily a, what NATO should be focusing on. I think NATO should see itself more as a facilitator, as a supporting player leave the coordination to the United Nations or the EU or organizations with more of a civilian focus. But those supporting functions can be very important, as we've seen in dealing with the migration issue in the Aegean and the Med in the last few years. Okay, my friends, I was super proud of myself and proud of you for the crisp professionalism with which we have been clipping through all of those questions. I did not realize, however, that people were adding them on to the end as we scythe through this wheat field. And I regret to say we will not have the opportunity to continue through to the end of the list. I thank everybody who did continue to contribute questions to this wonderfully rich, serious-minded, civil, encouraging debate. This is exactly the kind of conversation that we need to be having as we think about America's security responsibilities, where we want to keep them, where we want to change them. I really appreciate the substantive and civil contributions of these four incredible scholars and practitioners of American security policy. Thank you, Ambassador Hurst. Thank you, Professor Mueller. Thank you, Ambassador Vershba. Thank you, Professor Mearsheimer. And with that, I hand over to Melinda Herring to close us out. And thank you, Dr. Corey Shockey. You were a fabulous moderator. Thank you for your energy, your enthusiasm, and, and the insight that you shared here with us today. We would like to thank you for tuning in. If you haven't had a chance, please get on Twitter at AC Eurasia, and please vote which side was the most convincing. We'd love to know. I'd also like to thank our team at the Atlantic Council, Doug, Michael, Adrian, Laura, and the AV team. Thank you very much. We will be back, and I'd also like to thank the Charles Koch Institute for supporting these debates. Please come back in September. We will have a final debate about the future of Europe. Until then, thank you. <laughs>